Hi, this is Mike Brown, owner of Death Wish Coffee Company. Welcome to Fueled by Deathcast. I love Java, Death Wish Coffee presents Fueled by Deathcast, the world's strongest podcast. With your hosts, the incredible Jeff and the amazing D Man. Welcome, everybody, to episode number 19 of Fueled by Deathcast. I am the incredible Jeff. And we are in the new studio. We really are. Uh, we are building a studio. I think you might have seen us tease it a couple times uh, um, on the social media. But yeah, it's going to be our podcast studio. It's going to be basically our broadcasting studio for Death Wish Coffee. Yeah, it's a little bare right now. But I, man, this place is going to be awesome. It's cool that we're like in our own space. We're not in the conference room anymore on the ping pong pong table <laughs> people walking in wanting to play ping pong or whatever yeah uh, i mean it's it's pretty nice in here so far we got some natural light yeah which is good yeah which is yeah good. i feel real comfortable yeah um as always we have to thank our friend brock powell brock the, the incomparable yes he is <laughs> brockvox.com um go on over and see all the cool things he's doing in the world of voice acting uh we love brock so much um, this episode is featuring a very special guest, uh, comedian Kevin Bartini, and it is a recap of our live show at New York City Podcast Festival. And something to note, uh, things said on this podcast, uh, opinions expressed do not reflect the opinions of Death Wish Coffee Company. I mean, everybody, <laughs> we're going to talk to a comedian, and he is really funny, and they're just jokes. Nobody needs to get offended. <laughs> um, but uh, it was a lot of fun. We had so much fun down there. We met some really cool podcasters. In fact, shout out to Broad Wasted. Those guys are a lot of fun. Dude, I see. here's the thing. I'm not into Broadway dude I was so entertained yeah we were all laughing our yeah. asses off that was yeah. great yeah you can go check those guys out too um and uh our our own guest Kevin Bartini even has his own podcast the movie review preview preview review show something like that oh my gosh I get it right <laughs> I get it right when we're talking to him but uh, we'll be talking to him later on in the episode and I have to remind everybody this is week two of our super awesome contest. Yeah, so if you go to deathwishcoffee.com backslash deathcast, uh, you'll be able to find a little thing there where you can enter a contest to win uh, this this creamer decanter that we we pretty much, uh, it's a prototype. It's a one-off, that's yeah. it. The, the, there's only, th there's three different ones you can win. Grand prize is gonna win the one that's modeled after the Lucky Larry mug. Uh, second place is gonna win the one that's modeled after the Mardi Gras mug. And third place will win the one that's modeled after the two, 20, 2016 Valentine's Day mug. Yeah, and they're super cool. You're gonna be the only one to own this. So uh, all you got to do is go on over to deathwishcoffee.com slash deathcast where this podcast lives right at the top is your entry form just by giving us your email address you're entered but then once a day on some of them you can retweet and uh, you you can get more entries and then every week you can also continue to tweet uh, the tweets that we're giving you to tweet out on this and those give you more entries you can you just said tweet like eight times I know I know tweet 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 <laughs> but uh, but I mean there's multiple ways to get multiple entries on this and we will pick the winner on the May 4th episode secret code unlocked discount of death so this week, up until April 19th, if you type in the code COMEDY in yeah. the discount area, you will get 15% off of all of our coffee on deathwishcoffee.com. Mm, and we want to keep you all caffeinated, so use that code all the time this whole week for 15% off of coffee. And I'm going to try it. That's C-O-M-E-D-Y. Comedy. Comedy. Yes. <laughs> all right. So don't forget to type that in. You'll get that awesome discount and you'll be loaded up with caffeine. Ah, science! This week, Dustin, I actually have two separate science segments that kind of both tie in, not really tie into each other, but they both exist in the same realm, and that is archaeology for once. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, Ar archaeology isn't so scary. Exactly. We're not going to space this time. Um, for the first time in over a thousand years, archaeologists have laid eyes on the ancient Roman town of Eusatea, 
um, which has some pretty cool stuff that they found in there. And what's interesting about this find, they actually found it near the modern day city of Uzes in south in the south of France. They were construct they were um, breaking ground to construct a school, and they found these incredible mosaics wow, on the ground. Look at that. That's yeah. super detailed, and it led them to find some some pathways and some roads and some actual um, foundations of buildings. And what's really fun about this is we have heard of this um, city in an inscription on a stone slab in a nearby Roman city of Nemes. And it was talked about as a city like that was a marketplace, but we had never found it before. We had only the only mention of it was on this stone slab. So for the first time in a thousand years, humanity is laying its eyes on this stuff. And we're finding artifacts that date all the way back to the first Roman Empire. So how old is that? That's uh, crazy. F- um, it is, uh, well, the, like basically zero A.D., Whoa! Yeah, is what we're finding. We're finding artifacts from, and it's and it's really neat because, um, it's it's it, one of the main findings was a 250 square meter area that research believe were a public building because it was lined with these humongous grand columns but it it featured these beautiful hand tiled mosaics that you know were reserved for you know meeting places and and places of of reverence in that in that era you know so it was pretty cool to like to actually find that but we found dwellings we found you know um uh, a whole building that we believe was a winery because there were lots of wine jugs in there and like that kind of thing so uh it's cool to you know know about the ancient world and then actually put the reality of it little side note i i've i found out that uh back in those days Mm -hmm. uh, wine and ale and all that was drank more often because water actually went bad correct which is crazy to think about yeah i mean children started drinking wine at a very young age for that reason because you'd get sick off of the water supplies Whereas, you know, you're just going to get drunk as a child on wine and it's, yeah. you're not going to get as sick. Yeah, because they didn't, I mean, I doubt they even had like corks, but they didn't have to, <laughs> they definitely didn't have like plastic containers with screw on top to keep your water fresh. Definitely. They not. would lay like a layer of oil on top of the water to kind of preserve it, which is kind of crazy to think about. Yeah. Anyways, back on topic. Well, I want to go even farther back into human history because. Uh-oh. Also in archaeology this week, it was announced the discovery of a pyramid thought to be around 3,700 years old. Now, that, that dates back to Egypt's 13th dynasty. Wow. And what's neat about this is it was found near the remains of a pyramid we already know about, which is um, the pyramid of King Senefru. And what's famous about Senefru's pyramid is it's one of the ones that's called a bent pyramid because it was during the later dynasties of Egypt when they started really branching out and building pyramids in different areas of the desert. Um, the ground wasn't as stable as where the where the the the, the big pyramids are, yep. you know, the Great Pyramid and all that stuff. So they actually built the base at a different angle than the top and that's why it kind of looks like it has this bent shape oh, to it. Oh weird. So they they did it on purpose. It's not like a, it like it bent because of the foundation. They they, they actually yep. made up for the fact that they were on on steady ground and built it a specific way. That's pretty nuts. And what's cool about these pyramids are like the great pyramids, the most famous pyramids are not are not burial pyramids. Even though they most of Egypt Egyptology agrees that pyramids and these big things were tombs. The Great Pyramid has no bodies in it, and neither do the other two near it. Like, they found bodies near it, but they weren't necessarily built to be tombs. As Egypt continued to build pyramids throughout their different dynasties, they were all utilized as tombs. So this new pyramid that we found is completely destroyed, although we're finding pieces of it, and we're also finding, you know, the foundation, and then also um, tunnels, into the lobby way and stuff like that. Oh, so wow. the idea is is that we could find some more tombs um, it, that w- existed in this pyramid space. Wow, hopefully the, they weren't touched by raiders yet or anything. And, exactly. And well, everything's still in one piece down there. Well, and, and just to give you even more of an idea, the Senefru's pyramid, okay, was completed around the same time that this pyramid was completed, and that is you know, um, 3,700 years old, but Senefru himself ruled in the fourth, in the fourth dynasty of, as a pharaoh. So that was even before then, you know, they started work on their pyramids, 
you know, way before they died, obviously, yeah, yeah. you know. And uh, so it's, it's really cool to, again, find antiquities of human civilization that obviously we knew must have been out there, but we've never seen, we never laid eyes on until now. That's so cool. Can you imagine the, the stuff that we're going to find in the future with all the new technology we're, we're totally. able to use in order to find some of this stuff? It's pretty nuts to it think is. about that. It's really cool. As much as I love talking about space and that, those types of things in our science segments, I really do um, enjoy it archaeology and finding new things like that yeah even like cities underwater and yeah. all that kind of stuff so i really look forward to covering more stuff like this on our science segments yeah what fuels you so as we already said this week we get to recap nyc Podfest with our special guest comedian kevin bartini and one of the things that kevin was talking about which i thought was a great what fuels you moment is the idea of momentum in life, in your pursuit of your job, in pursuit of your goals, momentum is everything. Yeah, with each success gained in life, you should take that as a boost of speed, like a, a new platform to, to, to find other higher platforms to achieve. So that, I mean, don't stop. Pick up speed. Pick up momentum. Don't slow down just because you think you achieved something. Keep it going. You can achieve even more. Mm-hmm. And because, you know, so many people have a goal and then they hit that goal and they're like, okay, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I made it to that, that, that crest of the mountain. And mountain climbers talk about this all the time. You know, like they hit the top of the mountain and they look around and inevitably there's a higher peak behind them just laughing at them, you know, like, well, you didn't hit me, you know, and it's like, well, I got to get that one next, you know, and, and it's always about that is, is there's always the ideal that, Whatever you're doing in life can lead you to the next big thing. And if you're just about to achieve that next big thing, there's got to be something bigger behind it or parallel to it that you can, that you can jump over and try to achieve that too. Yeah, don't, don't stop. Don't ever stop. Just keep it going. Yeah. You know, you can, and that's how we see all these, uh, you know, uh, amazing achievers. Is It's not like they achieve this one big thing overnight. One thing led to a bigger thing, led to a bigger thing, led to this amazing thing that we all talk about today. And that's how they achieved it, was mm -hmm. momentum. Yeah, and I just look at some of the greatest inventors of our time, and I always use this example because he's the easiest to use. Look at Leonardo da Vinci. Da Vinci didn't just set out to go, okay, I'm gonna figure out this specific idea and you know, and stopped there. Look at the amount of achievements he hit upon in his short lifespan. And it was always because he was just looking for that next thing. Even when he was working on something, he was like drawing sketches of early helicopters and, and stuff that just boggled the minds of people just because he was constantly utilizing his momentum and, and, and building upon it. I think you see that a lot in of inventors in general. It's not like they were set off to make like one thing. Uh, you know, they just... They just came up with a plethora of inventions mm -hmm. that that was, you know, their successful momentum. Yeah, and I think that's a great thing to think about in everyday life is to just keep striving, keep pushing, keep that motivation to keep your momentum up in everything you try to do. Don't stop. Get it. Get it. It's that time of the week again for our brand new segment, the community shout out. And before we even get to that. I want to introduce a little special guest we have in here, uh, Eric Donovan. Hi. Hello. I'm special. You are special. <laughs> and because you were part of the team that just went across the pond over to London, and that ties into our community shout out this week because I want to shout out Timmy Medley. Yeah, it was actually an ocean. And uh, It was an ocean. You're yeah. right. You're right. Um, but uh, you guys got to meet Timmy Medley. We did. We got to spend a whole afternoon with him, and he is an incredible dude. Big old English vegan. <laughs> well, he's been such a great supporter of the podcast and of the company for so long. Um, we are tipping our hat to you, Timmy, this week. Uh, thank you so much for shouting us out. So you get a shout out for it. And what, I, what'd you do in the afternoon or or through the throughout the day in London with Mister Medley? So uh, first, Kane and Taya met up with them, uh, and they they went around, did a little drinking, did a little shopping, and then we all met up at this place called the End of the World Ooh, really? Bar. In, like the in, movie? In yeah, Camden. didn't they make a movie on that? Yeah, I don't think it was based on that particular place, but pretty cool, like, dingy rock and roll bar. And we all hung out, and everybody just kind of uh, drank and got to know each other, and we chatted about, you know, upcoming releases and coffee, life in general, and he, he awesome. talked about coming out and visiting us at some point, so hopefully he'll make it, uh, get a chance to come over here and, 
and spend a little time in the states and we can put them up or something like that. So that, that's that would be awesome. awesome. Yeah. How was London for you for you guys? Because we're dying to hear about the trip. It was so much fun. Yeah, London is an enormous city full of culture. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> Who would have thought? Yeah. It's so old. It's like super everything, old. everything there is like way older than us Americans I mean, even think of with the, buildings the, and stuff. The people are pretty normal age. <laughs> <laughs> I heard they have um, a pub there somewhere that's from 900 AD. Wow. Which is crazy wow. to think about. Yeah, I mean, even just like the uh, like Parliament Square and uh, Westminster Abbey and some of these like old buildings in the, in the, in the middle of central London. They're like 700 years old and they are so beautifully crafted. It was, it was awe-inspiring. That's for, awesome. To say the least. What was the favorite thing you saw? Uh, I think I think Big Ben and, and Westminster Abbey yeah. was, was something that was just like, it, it, it kind of stood on a whole, a whole new level. I mean, it, it, Big Ben itself, it's just one of those those world landmarks that you see in movies and you see, you know, on postcards and it's just everywhere. It's just, it's got to be really neat to just be in front of it in real life. How yeah. was the coffee there? The coffee it was very good. It's a different culture over there. Yeah, because yeah. they're a tea culture technically. Yeah, and it's you, you find a lot more, um, a lot more like light roasts and a lot more kind of espresso style coffee. So that's one of the things where we're kind of it was it was neat to get kind of immersed in that culture and kind of see how it's taken in over there. So we can adjust and make things, uh, you know, make our products even better for for. Uh, you know, to fit fit their culture. Yeah, so. you know, because we want we, we want to caffeinate the world, like we say on this podcast. So uh, we're going to starting with you, London. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for joining us on this little segment, Eric, because we were really excited to hear about all of the fun you guys had. It's not over. It isn't. Let's okay. Keep keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Eric's a joker. Sorry. Have a good time, everybody. <laughs> The Death Wish Death List. This week, we lost some pretty luminous uh, names in the world. Uh, first up, James Jim Marshall. He was 88 years old, and you probably have seen his name on an amplifier if you've ever watched a rock band play, because he created Marshall Amps. He had an incredible life story. When he was a kid... Uh, he contracted tuberculosis, and it completely affected his bones to the point where he was in a full body cast for a, much of his childhood. And he ended up taking up tap dancing to work on his muscles after the fact. That's that's strange. It is strange. That must have been like the workout regimen of, of the know. 40s. <laughs> yeah. um, this led to him dancing for a band during the World War II era. And the reason why I mention that is because when, when World War II hit and Britain was thrown into the mix, the drummer of that band was called to the war. So Jim took over as the drummer. And he actually became such a proficient drummer that he started a drum school. And he started teaching people how to play drums. And a couple of the people he taught were people like Mitch Mitchell, who later played drums for Jimi Hendrix, and Mickey Waller, who later played drums for Little Richard. Wow. Yeah. And then he's still young. He's the drummer, and he decides to open up a music store, and he starts tinkering with the amps of the, of the era at the time. And uh, he used to have these bassist customers that would come in and complain that they needed an amp that would help them, their sound, to go over the guitars of that, of that era. Yeah, because if, if anybody knows, um, being a bassist, you, you have to buy a much higher amperage uh, uh, amp. But uh, pretty much, you know, it, the 100-watt the hundred, the hundred guitar... Mm-hmm. Uh, does not it will overpower a hundred watt bass amp totally like completely you need like at least like a 400 watt bass amp to compete with a hundred watt guitar so i'm totally. sure he kind of solved this issue well he started tinkering around he started making these amps for bassists and it actually um caught the attention of pete townsend's father who actually played in bands with jim marshall and pete townsend is from The Who, that Pete Townsend. And so Pete contracted Jim Marshall to make him a guitar amp that was dirtier and louder than the Fender, the American-made Fender amps of the time. This led to what is known today as the Marshall Stack. And you've probably seen this on countless different things, which is two 
amplify two um s- like speaker Speakers, boxes yep. basically with an amp head as the controller on top which is still used today all the time if you've seen any of the famous famous footage of the who townsend used to use his guitar like an axe and he'd swing it into the into the amplifiers at the end of the show is like Jeez. this huge thing and then jim marshall would actually be the one to fix those amplifiers oh. so the who could go and play the next he show Townsend's a jerk <laughs> yeah um and the fame of the marshall amp skyrocketed after that every rock band started using it up until this day in fact i am a violinist in a rock band and i use a marshall amp um, and it, probably the most famous thing that Marshall was associated with was Jimi Hendrix at the time. Jimi Hendrix used all Marshall amps on his set during the famous Woodstock performance, and also that incredible image, and you know the one I'm talking about, of Jimi in front of his Marshall stack lighting his guitar on yep. fire. Yeah, and he, here's a great example of somebody who took momentum. Yeah. I mean, this guy... Got one step, he and then he made a bigger step. Yeah, I mean, to the point where now his name is on every single famous guitar amp ever. Yeah, and a, and one little um, bit of, of trivia that I learned actually when researching this, I thought this was really cool. That photo, that famous photo of Jimmy with his flaming guitar in front of the Marshall stack, includes three Jim Marshalls in that photo, and that is Jim Marshall, the creator of Marshall amps, James Marshall Hendrix. The oh. man who's lighting his guitar on fire, and the photo was taken by James Joseph Marshall. Huh. Pretty neat. Well, I wonder if James Joseph Marshall is still alive or if we've lost all of our time. Uh, I, don't, yeah, I don't know. I'd have to look that up. <laughs> um, but also this week, we lost an incredible comedian and actor, Don Rickles. He was 90 years old. He's a celebrated insult comic. I mean, if you don't know who Don Rickles is, you've been living under a rock. That uh, dude didn't care. He, he just didn't, didn't. He did not care. He earned the nickname of Mr. Warmth uh, when he started playing out in shows, and he became fast friends with Frank Sinatra, and Frank Sinatra used to call him Bullethead as a, as a little uh, dig on him. But he actually, um, Don Rickles actually became famous thanks a lot to Frank Sinatra because Sinatra went and saw him perform and liked him so much, and Rickles had no fear. Sinatra was a big star at this time, and he had no fear and called him out in the audience and made fun of him, and it was like, you don't make fun of Frank, you know? And he did on stage, and Frank thought it was great. And not only that, started having him, having Don Rickles open up for him in Vegas. And then that parlayed into Rickles actually having headline gigs in Vegas, and he became an auxiliary member of the famous Rat Pack at that time. Um, he started to get a lot of uh, press because he was part of Dean Martin's famous roast of Frank Sinatra, and he then went on to be roasted himself by um, all of those guys. He made tons and tons and tons of TV and movie appearances through his career, including the famous movie Run Silent, Run Deep, uh, next to Cary Grant, also Kelly's Heroes. He was on The Dick Van Dyke Show, The Addams Family, Gilligan's Island, Get Smart, Twilight Zone, I Could Continue Forever. He was a staple of a comedian on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and The Late Show with David Letterman. Both Carson and Letterman, they both have said that Rickles is one of their favorites of all time. Um, And he continued even working way later on into his career. One of my favorite roles Don Rickles did is a bit part in the movie Dirty Work with Norm MacDonald. Um, But he gained a lot of fame in recent years as Mr. Potato Head in the Toy Story movies. And that I'm not just saying the movies. He voiced the movies, the video games, the cartoons on the Disney Channel, the rides at Disney World and Disneyland. That was all Don Rickles. That dude worked hard his whole life. Once again, another great example of momentum. It really, really is. So it's uh, sad to see him go. But, you know, thank you so much for everything you gave us, Don. And a death wish you a happy birthday this week. Uh, if you're listening to this when this comes out, Thursday, April 13th, friend of Death Wish Coffee, we love you, Ron Perlman, Hellboy himself, is going to be 67 years old. On Friday, April 14th, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Sarah Michelle Geller will be turning 67 years old. She no, is <laughs> not. She is going to turn 40, and she doesn't look a day over 20. Uh, on Saturday, April 15th, Arya Stark is going to be 20 years old. Macy Williams. She has, what a career she's going to have ahead of her. Yeah. And on Sunday, April 16th, Billy West is going to be 65. He is one of my favorite voice actors. He is the... He is the voice of, just to name a few, Fry from Futurama. Doug uh, Funny. Doug Funny. And yeah. I mean, I could just, I could go on, but yeah. I won't. Go look him up. He's 
awesome. And we're going to take a short break and give you this week's D-Man update. D-Man's Death Wish Update. Brought to you by Death Wish Coffee. What do we got this week? What do we got? We got a lot of really cool stuff this week. So as you're listening to this, we have just released our Death Wish New Era hats. Now this comes in two different styles. One in our uh, usual black and red scheme with our logo right on the front. But we did make uh, an industrial style in like a slate gray with a with a black industrial patch on the front. They are the highest quality hat that we could possibly order. And I can't wait to get these to you guys. I'm, I love them so much. I mean, just to be able to wear a new era hat with Death Wish Coffee on it is so cool. And it's snap back so it fits everybody. It's just, it's a great product get 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 it today put it on your hat at your head and never take it off yeah and we do have a very limited supply i'm not sure if they're going to sell out on the first day but they just might and if they don't they will sell out eventually i don't know if we will restock them so if you want them get them quick yeah so also talking talking about restocking uh i will i do want to let you guys know that i will be restocking the uh Valhalla java t-shirt so if you did not get one in your size uh just just wait a week or two and and that should restock in no time i love that t-shirt and you know guys it's one of the the perks that uh i get to do this show with you d-man because you're the guy that orders all this stuff so it's like i get to know exactly you know it's like oh yeah we're running low on that well i'll just order some more for yeah. you so. so we we do have some more coming i they're great t-shirts i think we'll be keeping them around all year uh, i love that i love that logo that we came up with this year for the for the Valhalla java so I got to ask you a question. I've noticed that our good buddy here, John Swedish, has been out of the office lately, and I was wondering if you knew where he might be going. Well, it's funny that you asked that, Jeff. (laughs) (laughs) What, I didn't set that up good enough? (laughs) (laughs) Well, we have some of the fruit of his labor here right in front of you. We have uh, successfully refined the process of making the cold brew, and it is now better than ever. Jeff has yet to try it. I haven't tried it yet. They almost had him try it earlier. I slapped the coffee out of his hands. We wanted to keep his taste buds virgin so he could try it right now and uh, give his reaction to you guys. But this is... This is a cleaner cold brew than we have ever brewed before. We put it up against other cold brews to see if how, how well it checks out. And it, man, I'm so impressed with this, and I can't wait to release this to you guys. Now, what Jeff has in front of him here is a actually the non-nitrogenated version. Mm-hmm. Uh, tomorrow, as we're recording this tomorrow, um, we will be uh, starting the new canning process. Yeah. So it's just a matter of time before we release it to you guys. And we have a lot more yield this time around. So... I don't imagine it will sell out as quick, but do get it while supplies last. This will be much more delicious than the last round. So, Jeff, please oh, I've try been, it. I've been really excited to try this. Here now, I go. Now, as you try it, make sure it hits the sides of your tongue. That'll kind of give you the nice chocolatey notes. Oh, yeah. Now, okay, I've drank this from the very first try that we've tried <laughs> the at mud. this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the rocket fuel mud. And it is a process that we're refining and we're getting better. And I'm telling you guys right now, this that I just tried, this is the best cold brew I've ever had. And I'm not, and yes, I'm paid to say that, but I mean, it's <laughs> like when it really comes down to it is, is I, I really am not sh- like bullshitting you when I say I've tried everything every iteration of this this cold brew and i feel like we really captured what the taste of death wish coffee is into this cold brew i feel like the last one we kind of we kind of missed what death wish coffee uh actually has to offer and uh, this one i think we really really nailed it down and we're going to be releasing this you know very soon once we get it all canned and ready to go for all you guys so if you got to try some of this the last time you're going to be pleasantly surprised with the taste of this it's a little different it's a little nicer it's got that like you said those chocolatey notes it's it's really really fine and if you didn't get a chance to try it before this is going to be a brand new territory for you and it's going to be it's going to be great i'm excited for this definitely check out our youtube and possibly our facebook as well um i'm hoping that d-man and myself we're going to be able 
able to go over to Air, Old Saratoga Brewery and get some uh, some some footage of the canning process. So even as I'm talking to you now, that footage might be I'm available. I'm just hoping I, I can just stand there with my mouth open and somebody will take a hose and blast <laughs> that into my face. I'm going to Facebook Live that if that happens. <laughs> I can't wait. But keep in mind, uh, now that we have refined the process, and we did, we can now produce this much more readily. So it... We're, you know, we're thinking about getting it out on the retail shelves eventually. Yeah. And, uh, you know, most of all, it'll just be more readily available for you guys on DeathWishCoffee.com. Yeah. And as always, tune in every week for the update for more Deathwish Coffee Company news. Cheers. Oh, welcome back to the show. <laughs> this week is the recap of NYC Podfest. D Man, I had so much fun going down to the city with you and performing live. Yeah, man, that was incredible being up on stage in front of a crowd and just doing what we do usually here in an empty room. It was, yeah. it, was, it was a complete different beast, but you know what? I felt pretty comfortable up there. I did too. It was and it was funny because I was a little nervous going in there, not because we were performing live, it was just because it was a whirlwind of emotion and we hadn't even met Kevin in person yet. We've been emailing back and forth. He was nice enough to agree to be our guest on this show, but our first meeting face-to-face was... 10 minutes before we hit the stage. So, you know, you, your nerves are a little bit, you know, frazzled at that point. But boy, Kevin was just so much fun. He is so funny. Yeah, not only was, yeah, not only was he like completely hilarious, but he, he has a lot of cool stuff he's working on. Yeah, and we, totally. we got we got to talk a lot about that. And it, it was just a lot of fun being up there with it, him. It really was. So uh, here you go, guys. This is the recap of our live performance of Fueled by Deathcast on this year's NYC Pod Fest. Mugs up. The Fueled by Death Guest. Welcome, everybody, to New York City Podcast Festival. We're all here, and we're all having a good time. We are Fueled by Deathcast, and we are joined by the incomparable Kevin Bartini. He is amazing, and we brought some goodies for him, and we're going to show you guys real quick, because we are a podcast put out by Death Wish Coffee, which is the world's strongest coffee. Um, and a lot of people always ask us, what is the difference between the world's strongest coffee and espresso? And well, the thing is, espresso is actually a type of grind. So what we did here today is we're going to make a little bit of a espresso out of Death Wish Coffee and see if we can uh, kill our guests with caffeine. <laughs> That's what we really want to try and do is, is give them cardiac arrest in front of you all, and then we'll laugh. It'll sure. be fun. <laughs> well, little did you guys know that I've already been drinking backstage yes. the next show out is broad wasted and they were like why don't you get wasted with us so this is just gonna balance me back out the, and i'll the, probably do a decent show so. the, the tip of the iceberg so yeah. what i have here is called a mini presso oh. and it's made specifically for on the go espresso making it's pretty high tech and it makes weird squeaky sounds and looks like a pipe bomb but <laughs> it makes coffee have you tried to bring that onto an airplane before no not yet <laughs> But Deathwish Coffee is, like I said, the world's strongest coffee. And the reason why is the way we roast our beans and where we get our beans from. Uh, we are the number one seller on Amazon. You can check us out at deathwishcoffee.com, where this podcast lifts. And uh, we just want to caffeinate the world. That's all we want to do to you people. Uh, we got, you know, free stickers and stuff you can go grab at the, after the show. But we're really excited to be here on PodFest, talking with all you guys, and especially you, Kevin. Um, you are our first comedian on this show. Really? Yeah. Wow. Um, we bring on a guest every week on uh, Fueled by Deathcast, and we, the reason why is because we are all fueled by death. We're all fueled to do something awesome before we leave this rock forever. And uh, one of the greatest jobs I feel in the world is to make people laugh, and that's what you do, Kevin. And I kind of wanted to start by asking you what got you into the comedy scene. What, 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 what influenced you to start going out there and trying to make people laugh. Was before I answer that, should I? Yeah, should yes, I, yeah, please, go for please. It. We want to see if this is going to... Sober up here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sweet Jesus! <laughs> we I want more it. of that! <laughs> we can we make got, that we happen. Can make that was that very happen. good. That was very good. Uh, so, what, your question was, what like, got yeah, me what, into what, it? What made you start, you know, being a comedian? Man, I, listen, I was like... Um, I was a child of the 80s where there was that comedy boom. It was just on TV all the time, and uh, I, I absolutely loved it. I, I would watch every night. I would watch stand-up. I mean, like, you know, my, my family would gather around the television at least once a week whenever Jerry Seinfeld popped up on one of those shows. It was yeah. just, everybody came running to watch, and, and, you know, people would do five, six-minute sets, and I would just 
I would be, when, when my favorite guys were done after five minutes, I just wanted more. I was like pissed, oh, five minutes, that's it. You know, right. I, I would be bummed. And I, uh, I was also, you know, coincidentally like the funny kid and it just seemed like the thing to do. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's weird because you can be an athletic kid and watch sports and, and aspire to be an athlete, but, mm-hmm. you know, but you, you can't just go play for the Yankees. You know, you can't right. do that. You have to have people along the way moving you up. You want to be a comic, you can. You can just go start and do some open mics, and if you can, if you can swing your dick with everybody, then you can stay in the game, right. you know? No, and that's, that's very true. I think that, that pertains to a lot of things in life and not just comedy. Yeah. Um, you know, just get out there and do it. Um, like dick swinging, for example. Yeah, like dick you swinging. Know? If get you want to swing dick, I mean, just get out there and flop it around. You might be like the a... best dick swinger there yeah. is, and we don't know it. So if you want to just go try after the show, I'll be out on that corner. You may be the next pictures. baby elephant just yeah. swinging your tusk. You never know. The helicopter. <laughs> helicopter, I, yeah. I don't do that anymore because I chipped a tooth. So. <laughs> um, and so your career has led to... You know, playing in clubs, and also you mm-hmm. have become a warm-up comedian for yeah. a lot of different shows, including mm-hmm. Daily Show and Colbert. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the difference between being someone who warms up crowds before a show and then maybe just you know playing to the crowds at one in the morning at a bar? Like, do you, do you, is it a different? Well, set? there's a, a lot less approach? drunks at That's 5 true. p.m. on the Daily Show That's set true. than That's true. than 1 a.m. in a club. Um, yeah, it's a lot more, if you, if you do warm up, audience warm up, it, it's not stand up. You're not, and anybody who goes out just trying, thinking you can just do a seven to 10 minute set, then you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna fail at the job because your, your job is to create energy and oftentimes to channel that energy and focus it. Like I, mm. I did, I did um, the presidential conventions uh, with, with The Daily Show. So I toured with them. We went on the road for two weeks. It was the greatest thing that I've ever done in my life, wow. you know? Um, and, uh, you know, for, for th- times like that, I mean, this, is, this was back five years ago now. And, you know, we, would co- we came to town it was, it felt like Led Zeppelin coming to town in 1975, Whoa. you know, just people were lined up to get tickets, they were, people would, would make their, plan their vacations around coming to see the show, and, and, and so they're so excited, and they're so amped up when they get in there that my job was literally just, just to bring, to, not just get them laughing, but to get their attention focused, because the show needs the audience to, to play a role. And, and, and to bring energy and, and focus uh, to the show. So a lot of that job is understanding that and understanding how to get people to do what you need and how to carry yourself so that you earn that, that respect and that you earn that from the audience. So wow. you could go into a bar at one in the morning and, and do some crowd work. Like I would probably talk to like that lady right there who's on her phone and be like, what the fuck are you doing on your phone? I'm trying to perform <laughs> for you. And we would have a dialogue then and then we would... Screw, you know, so, uh, at the, but at, at the show, I can't necessarily be mean to you, I can't, right. you know, I have to be more, more playful, you, you know, you, you're, you're doing a, another, you know, you're doing a set at 1 a.m. somewhere, and, you know, I can maybe be a little bit more, uh, the parameters of what I can make fun of are, are more wide, because worst case scenario is just the club doesn't have me back and I'm out $15 a week. You know what right. I'm saying? But the show, the show, if you fuck up, you get fired and that's a big deal. So do, you, like, do you learn that the hard way or try, no. try some jokes that might've been a little bit too risky for no. the Daily Show? No, it's never, it's never about jokes. It, it's about like I always, with crowd work in general, I kind of have a ground rule that I'll never make fun of somebody. And, and I probably learned this hard way, you know, but I'll never make fun of somebody that they, for something that they can't control. If it's God's fault, I'm not gonna make fun of you for it. So if you're morbidly obese, if you're, you know, if, if you're, you, whatever it is, if, if, if it's how you were born, if it's the way you are, I'm not gonna make fun of you for that because you probably, you're here to have a good time and you're probably self-conscious about that, you know? But the guy shows up, first of all, I love you people from Brooklyn. You show up to studio audiences, I can pick you out right away and we can make fun of you and your lip rings and your, facial hair and all that shit all day because that's your choice and it's ridiculous, you know? <laughs> but, uh, you know, you're, you, you show up with your, your 55-year-old white dad and he's wearing a Hawaiian shirt. I'm going to attack that, you know? Like, yeah. that's the kind of stuff. But when you're in a comedy club, especially, if somebody heckles you, 
then all bets are off. Then those rules are out the table. Then I'm going to call you a fat fuck and I'm going to make you cry because <laughs> it's prison yard rules. I have to make an example of you. <laughs> so Got to earn that respect. Yeah, so everybody else doesn't think it's feeding yeah, time. So yeah. then I will, I will, oh, believe me, I can zone in on your insecurity. Toot sweet and just have <laughs> at you. you know? that, that's awesome. It actually <laughs> brings up something I wanted to bring up is one thing in comedy that you can't learn, you have to kind of learn on the job is being heckled. Yeah. Um, and I mean, d ha have you have you dealt with that a lot? I'm sure I know every comedy co or comedian has, but have you dealt with that a lot? Like I in mean, your career, there were just yeah, there were a lot of years where I would just take the stage, and you know, every night somebody would just holler up, "You're too handsome to do comedy." Oh, you know, man, you are that sucks. jerks. You, we jerks. don't believe your problems. You are too sexy for this world. That kind of stuff. So once you realize, okay, that's what they're going to hit you with, then you... Uh, no. kind of. Yeah, the worst is out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, when you're doing comedy, especially when you're, you're a, a New Jack comic, um, very oftentimes the audience isn't going to remember you one way or the other. If you're, you know, if you're on the road at a club where where I'm the headliner and you know, so somebody else is featuring and doing a half hour and there's a host doing 15 minutes. We're all on some level professionals and you're just the new open micer in town and they're giving you five minutes. Unless you piss your pants in front of that audience, they're going to leave that show that night not talking about you. If I did my job right, they're talking about me. They're not going to remember you. So you're going to, that's where you take your lumps. Let them heckle. Who gives a shit? They're strangers. Right. They won't remember me. They'll come in three months and I'll be here again and they probably will not remember me. So They'll remember you if you piss your pants. If though. you piss your pants, yeah. yeah. Ab absolutely. <laughs> but I just kind of always have that mentality. Even to this day, even if I'm on a regular club show in the, in the city doing 20 minutes, I still... I still at least trick myself to think there's some anonymity to it. I'm not, I'm not one of these comics that the that you know that the comic nerds blog about and get pissed about if he says something. I'm not on their radar, which yeah. is fine with me. Yeah. You know? So it just gives me some freedom that go do what you want and 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 let the chips fall where they may. Because if somebody blogs about you, if they talk shit about you, then all that does is make you more popular because your no such fans thing as bad press. no your fans the, the times it has happened to me my fans come out of the woodwork to you know to defend me and to and, and which is a what a great fun day that always is, is when you just <laughs> sit back and, and, and just watch it all unfold watch this war happen on social media for something you did and i just sit there and just eat popcorn and enjoy it it's know? funny because we can kind of relate that re relate to that as a coffee company because we are the world's strongest coffee and because mm -hmm. we were so, so successful that there there was a lot of companies to come out of the woodwork to, to claim that they were the strongest coffee and pretty much all they're doing is advertising for a genre that we created. Yeah. And it, and it worked it works out really well. So how do you really decide? Well. Do you like arm wrestle or? Mm -hmm. No, it's a, it's a ninja battle on a roof. It's a ninja battle to the death. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Who's See, the world's weakest coffee? Uh, Folgers? Decaf? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, decaf Tea. is, is tough. Yeah, decaf's not even coffee. We, get, decaf, we water. get that a lot at conventions where people will come up while we're you know selling our coffee or giving out free samples and, and everybody thinks they're they're a comedian, you know this obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, that uh, you know, and they'll say, "Oh, don't you guys have any decaf?" And we always hand them a cup of water and say, "Get the hell out of here!" Right? You know, like, cause, mm -hmm. I've I there's 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 three things I will never put into my body, and this is just the way I live. There's three things my whole life I'll oh, never boy. put in my body: a decaf coffee, non-alcoholic beer, and a penis. Yeah, and that's yeah, it. I knew that's coming. <laughs> After that, it's all on. I don't give a shit. I have that. Right I have now. no. I don't understand the appeal of decaf coffee. I do not understand the appeal of 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 non-alcoholic beer. I just it's dick. I get you know. Yeah. It looks awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, that has a lot of and pros. It, it has and it's a lot a, of pros. It's a daily struggle. Yeah. You know, to maintain <laughs> the code that, that I live by. Body. Yeah. I get it. I get that. I get that. That's good though. I mean, you know, you have to have goals. Just chewing on pen caps all day. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, um, you know, and. Comedy has led you down some pretty interesting angles, and I know this is a couple years old at this point, but it's something that I wanted to bring up on this podcast for our listeners as well. Um, you led a campaign to rename a street. <laughs> yes. And uh, it wasn't just, you know, just I want Kevin Bartini way or nothing. Like, it wasn't like well, that. Well, it was. It was. <laughs> it was. It started that way, and they told me I haven't earned it. 
<laughs> well, you you renamed, I believe it was 121st Street, was it? Yeah. Yeah, uh, you renamed it Carlin's Way. Yeah, 121st Street uh, in Manhattan is now named for George Carlin. Which, it's the only street... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Seriously. That deserves a clap. For See, you. it's the first street in New York City to be named after, in honor of a stand-up comedian. Um, Gilda Radner has a street, and there's a couple other television comedians, but he's the first stand-up to get his own street. And in. that's incredible. Like, can you talk a little bit about what that entailed even doing? Like, was that yeah. just a lot of going to town hall and beating on doors? And... Pretty much. I yeah. mean, it, it was, it was, um, it was interesting. It just started kind of as a whim, just kind of as this idea. I live not far, I live in the same neighborhood where George Carlin grew up, and I just noticed that nobody, if you go up there, to me, to a comedy fan, if you're a Carlin fan, Morningside Heights is, it's Abbey Road to a Beatles fan. I mean, yeah. this is where Class Clown, Occupation Fool, they're all set there. there there's so much of his life, his, his TV show was set there, you know. Um, and so I made a I made a little pilgrimage uh, up there to, to, to actually find his building. And I, I got there, and he'd been dead for about three years at this point, and you wouldn't know that he'd ever stepped foot in that block. You know, there's, there's, um, <clears throat> there's no street sign, there's no, there's no sandwich in the deli, there's no plaque on the building or anything. And so I got it into my mind, and um, I didn't know how to do it or, or how to go about it, uh, so, you know... The first thought was that I would go in and ask John Stewart and to say, "Will you make this happen?" Because he's a Carlin fan, right? And he yeah. can get the mayor on the phone. And I was like, "I figure we can have this done by Saturday," right? You know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so he actually put one of his staffers on it, uh, who had a connection in, in City Hall, to find out the process. And it's this whole there's a, there's a lot of bureaucracy you have to go through. And um, I had to go out and I had to stand and collect signatures and I had to. Uh, you know, then I had to present them to this community board. And what happened is as soon as I presented it to the community board um, and it became public, um, I got into a fight with the Catholic Church. Like a fist fight? Yes. If it could have been a fist fight, a, that would have been awesome. A ninja rooftop fight? It was this crotchety, because here is this crotchety, like 85-year-old priest who had a personal beef with George Carlin because George lived on this street because the church and the school were on that street. That's right. why his mother moved him there. Right. He's the most famous alumni of this school, but they're mortified by this. <laughs> so they put up this big fight. They, they put up this big fight. Now, normally to get a street named after somebody should take 18 months on average. This took us three years because wow. it took 18 months just to fight the Catholic Church. I Guys, I'm telling you, I had them beat on... Um, I had 500 signatures on paper, pen and pa- paper, 500 signatures in the neighborhood. They, re- they had a letter-writing campaign over the course of 18 months. They had collected 80 letters. I had 500. I beat them 580. We did an online petition on change.org, and we had, I, I, was it five or 10,000 signatures? We had more signatures on our petition on that block on, on that one block, we had then they had all totaled. We had beat them by three to one. We, we'd killed them, but politicians are afraid of the church, and they're afraid of, right. of this priest who has literally a pulpit to, to talk to his congregation. So um, I, I mean, how great is this? I was in a public fight with the Catholic Church, and it was in every newspaper in the country. It was everywhere. And what was ridiculous about it was that the priest had a personal grudge with George, but he couldn't say that in the press, that that was his reason for fighting me. So he decided that he was going to base his campaign to fight us on the idea of the Catholic Church wants to protect children. Well, uh, for the first time uh, ever, yeah. you know? <laughs> I was going to say, you know, I didn't know that was on their docket. <laughs> just my luck. After 2,000 years, this is when they get woke <laughs> about protecting kids. Define protect. <laughs> does, ma- does that mean embracing can, from behind it, it, it means that uh, they can't uh, ever be exposed to someone who has a contrarian thought, but you can still fuck them. Ah. It was basically where they were. So, <laughs> guys, I'm not joking. There was a day where it was the, the New York, I think it was the Daily News. It was the Daily News or, or the Post, I forget. And um, you open the paper, and there was a big full-page story on, on me and on the, the campaign. Big picture of me, big article, and this whole thing. And they're interviewing me, and they interviewed the priest talking about protecting children. On the facing page, as big a picture as me, the facing page was just as big a picture of a priest doing a perp walk. 
He oh. was literally oh had been arrested God. as wow. a pedophile. That you could not. The, the letters to the editor just kept flooding in. And again, it was just one of those things where I just sat back and just watched everybody fight it out. At this thing I created. Um, <laughs> So we, we ended up, you know, we ended up finally finding some compromise and moving it along, and we got it out of committee, and we got it into the uh, city council who makes the final decision, and um, we, were, we were approved unanimously, which yeah, doesn't happen wow. often, but every member of the city council voted to support it, and the, the sign hangs to this day. And it's excellent. Yeah. I, I, that's, I always wanted to hear that story. That's really yeah. cool that, you know, your career track can just bring in something like that, that you never, like you said, you never thought you would. You know, no, I never. Like, it was just an idea, offhanded idea. Yeah, I kind of, I'm a, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a kind of a guy. Like, I, 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 when I move up a step in the in the comedy world, or or new opportunities, new people, new things, my, my my thing is always, well, how can I capitalize on this and do something else? So it's like I was just recently hired by The Daily Show, mm -hmm. and I don't think. It was literally, I thought I could go to Jon Stewart and get this done. Right. So I, I don't think if I hadn't have been working there, that would have just been a fleeting idea that would have passed. Right. You know what I'm saying? And then having done that for three years, I made a lot of great contacts. And I met a lot of people in the comedy world and a lot of, you know, Robert Klein and people like this. And, you know, I'm, I'm friends with, with Kelly Carlin and I'm hanging out with, with all these great people. And then it was the next, it was like, okay, well, this is Project's Done, what's next? So I start doing a podcast. And I'm bringing on all these comedians that I've just met and all these folks and, and, and we're, we're getting to have these great guests and it's just because they're who I met through that thing. And it's then like a momentum next. game at that point. It's, yeah, it, it should be. You, you, you don't want to rest on your laurels. You want, to, you want to be able to take what you have and build on that. Yeah. Use those connections. I've never, I've never gone to a comedy club and said, you should book me because I'm the guy who got George Carlin way done and you <laughs> owe it to me. You know, I don't do that because right. that's douchey. Right. But... I'm happy to give Dave a tell a call because I know him through that and, right. and try to get him on the show. You know, that kind of stuff. Right. And, and it's just always. So I'm, you know, I'm just always looking for that next thing. And that's nice. a great outlook on life is to have, you know, never be never be complacent. Always yeah. wanna always wanna keep striving to do something different. And you brought it up and which is something I was gonna go to too. We are on a podcast festival. Yeah. And you have your own podcast. I um, do. The movie preview review show. I got that yes. right, right? Yeah, yeah the I movie preview review podcast. The premise is that we review movies based on only watching their previews. Which is really smart because most movies give you the whole yep. damn thing. They really in the do. Trailer they now. really do. A How lot often of them... do you find yourself like pretty much feeling the same way after actually watching the movie? Do you still have like the same, the, uh, the same thought? Uh, there's, yeah, there have been times where I've, I, I've, I've been like, oh, okay, I was a little off on that. Uh -huh. You know, sometimes it surprises you, but no, more often than not, I think about 95% of the time yeah. I'll go back later and be like, yeah, we were pretty, pretty much dead on balls, accurate. But, it, but the show has a cast of. There's there's four our core four, yeah. and then we always have a guest on there, and like, um, well, for example, my co-host. Jellybean Jay Schmidt is in the audience today. Hey, Jellybean not, Jay Schmidt. Not to support me or our podcast, but his wife's he's... podcast is coming up. That's why he's here. <laughs> Let's not pretend that we have a real team effort going on our side. <laughs> <laughs> but Jay and my producer are, are really into like the comic book movies and the sci-fi, and I'm not. I can't, you know, so they counterbalance that. And my, my wife is on there, and she's into the chick flicks, and that kind of counterbalances us, and the guest is always into something. So... Which is important because I, I didn't want the show to be just shitting on a movie. I thought that wasn't fair, yeah. you know, to just shit on a movie. So I like that, you know, it's rare that all five people at the table will shit on a movie at the same time. It uh -huh. happens, and, and, you know, that's a big sign. But it kind of, at the end of the day, it kind of feels like you go to the movies with five year, four or five year friends previews are playing and you're all talking to each other about mm -hmm. it. Do you yeah. want to see that? I don't, oh, I hate that guy. I want to, and, then, and that's just kind of what happens. It just becomes a conversation about whatever. It is a great show. Everybody Thank go you. check it out. Uh, like I said, movie preview review. Um, mm -hmm. You guys just Thanks. celebrated two million downloads. Yes. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I kind of, being at a podcast festival, I wanted to ask you this We've question. We've put out 75,000 episodes though, so it's not <laughs> that. 
<laughs> what was Take it your like? Clap back. <laughs> what was it like um, having the idea to start up with a podcast? Because everybody has their own story to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kevin Smith famously talks about you know just go out there and do the thing that you want to do, and that's why he started doing it. And podcasting has become this juggernaut of a thing. Where yeah. I mean, we're all talking to you guys right now. Yeah. And I and I'm always curious to hear how other podcasters kind of made that you know. Pulled that, pulled that ripcord and was like, I'm going to do this. Well, so. for a comedian, for stand-up, um, having a podcast has become as ubiquitous as having a website. You know, like, I, like I, I started comedy before websites, really. So there became that point where, oh, everybody's getting a web page. Okay, now I've got to do that. And then, like, California, their scene is, like, five to seven years ahead of us in, in embracing podcasts. Uh-huh. Like, it's... it's so, um, and a couple of hours ahead of us too. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, you know, you, 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 all of a sudden I, I just saw, oh, well, if I have a podcast and I can get a following and people like that, I can help sell more tickets on the road. It's the same thing of having a Twitter following a, a, a comedy club booker is, you know, yeah, they're interested in, are you funny to an extent? It's more, can you put asses in my seats? Can right. I? roll the dice that you're going to put asses in the seats. And that's why they'll, some comedy club in this nation right now has Steve-O for the weekend. And another comedy club has fucking Screech. They're not funny, but Don't they will bring the people seats. to come and have drinks. Right. You know? So if you have a comedy podcast and you can build a fan base, then that, that helps. And that's the purpose it serves. And I just didn't want to be, I didn't want to be the 977th Mark Maron ripoff because mm-hmm. more often than not, it's a comics podcast is one comic talking to another and they're talking about comedy and right. those, you know, if you're Maron, you do it well. Everybody else not so much and it's right. just it, it gets it, it gets to the point where I I wouldn't listen to this. I can't believe many other people do mm. and so it's not serving the function that I needed to do, which is to help me on the road and and you know so so we came up. I came up with this concept that was different and. Um, you know, I had met Jay at the UCB. We had taken classes together, and I'd worked with my producer Adam on other projects. And um, my wife, you know, slept with me to get the gig. What can I tell you? No, <laughs> uh, no, you know. But you know, she and I have a, a, a fun uh, rapport back and forth. And, and it's just like, all right, well, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do it with friends. I'm gonna do it where it's fun. And um, it, it became a thing where we did it every Monday night. And um, it did, you know, it, it became a thing where we all just started realizing we were looking forward to that more than anything of the week. Because yeah. it's like, okay, yeah, it's just a night, you know, like my grandparents, when they were my age, would play cards with their friends once a week and check in. And I don't think we kind of do that, but, but I have this where let's sit around the table and let's just hang out and, and jaw on for a little while. Yeah. And, you know, and we'll just bring another another outsider in and, and play. And, and, you know, luckily for us, um, our, we built a fan base and people have been listening. And now the next step is where we want to do live ones and we want to be able to bring them in and, you know, go do it. You know, I'll go do a comedy club for the weekend. Jay will come open, you know, feature for me. And then we'll do, do a live show as well there. Oh, that's and, a great idea. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's how we figure we'll be able to monetize the damn yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I hear, to, you know, to be successful, you have to be best, first, or different. And it sounds like you went mm. on that different path. Yeah, we went down different, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, I mean, as a comic, I'm sure you've had to struggle through some shit. And we're, we like to ask our guests, no matter who we're talking to, what fuels you? But what, what really did like, fuel you past grinding it out through all the tough times of trying to make it? Um, desperation, you know, I, I, (laughs) no, no joke. I remember, um, I remember when I was probably in high school watching some, it wasn't like it it was on E, it wasn't like an E true Hollywood story, but it was like a profile of a, of a, of a movie star and it was Kevin Bacon. And I remember him in this interview saying that he purposely didn't go to college and he didn't learn a trade and he didn't learn anything else. And the idea was so that he would never have something he could fall back on. No safety net. No safety net. So I've kind of done, the, the, done that. I, I, I did about a semester and a half of community college, and it was basically that was just killing time till I was old enough to start going into comedy clubs and bars and performing. And so I started, you know, I was about 19 or 20, and, um, you know, the first 10 years is 
purely out of love, love of doing it, love of learning the craft. And then, uh, you know, the next, these last eight years have been kind of reaping the rewards and, and getting to, you know, meet a lot of my heroes and work with them and getting these cool opportunities. And uh, now I'm just kind of motivated because I have no safety net and yeah. this is my career. I got to make a living at it. I got to keep moving forward and I got to keep producing and doing things. And that's why you, you know, that's why I do a podcast and I do other things because you can't just do stand up and right. survive. You just right. can't. You'll, yeah. a, a, you won't make any money or, or B, you'll just go insane. Yeah, that's, I feel like that's why you need to do something that you love because you need that love to propel you for the, through the first 10 years of yeah. shit. You know, and yeah, then, absolutely. And, and if you're not loving it, you're just, you're just going to give up halfway through. Right, exactly. But you made it I've, 18 years deep. So far. Gnarly, man. So far, so good. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, for, so for people who are getting into the, into the career track that you're in, into uh -huh. comedy, would you give any advice to anybody who's, who's just starting out in that field? Well, I kind of touched on it earlier, but um, really relish the anonymity that you have in the beginning. Um, um, you know, don't... Try not to do the shows constantly where you have to bring all of your friends out. Try not to do that. Just go somewhere where you can get up and you can, you can practice, you can flounder. You, you'll never, you know, the greatest free throw thrower in the NBA right now got that way because when he was a kid, he was down at the local court till you know till the sun went down or he was he was doing free throws uh at, at, at his barn you know wherever it was but he didn't have a crowd watching him duff and miss again and again in that embarrassment you yeah. know so just go out find the mics find the um the places that will let you get up and embrace failure because it's first of all bombing just creates a scab you don't. You get to my level. I don't give a shit about bombing. You know, it doesn't happen that often. But I don't. I. It, it's not. I'm not going to go home and and hang myself in my closet if the show didn't go well. Right. It's like okay, well, there's a next one. And that's because for many years I was out in the middle of nowhere on the road where nobody really knew me. I could try. I could take chances. And I, by doing that, learned my voice. Learned how to do this. And and now I'm. You know, now I maybe don't have that anonymity so much anymore. Um, but I'm. But I'm ready for whatever comes at me. Awesome. That, yeah. That's that's really great. Um, I, finally, like, where uh, can people find you? And do you have anything coming up that you want to plug? Like, uh, yeah. Where, well, let's see. People can find me. KevinBartini.com is my one-stop shop. You can find the Twitter and the movie preview review right through there. Um, coming up, I'm. Well, I'm on a little mini stand-up hiatus because I'm about to do a play. We're doing Cymbeline um, at Theater 80, which is off-Broadway, and uh, that'll be running April 21st through May. Uh, if you're into, if you want to see me do audience warm-up, I'm currently doing it for uh, season two of Comedy Knockout, and then I'll be doing it for uh, the President Show on Comedy Central after that. Um, the but comedy knockout yeah. show is really uh, building it's a cool some show. steam, man. Yeah, it's a cool, fun show. That's really good. That, that must good be fun to be on that set. Yeah, it is. It's 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 uh, it, it's always cool when you're doing a show with other comics because there's you know every episode there's somebody on there who I haven't seen in a while and I yeah. haven't worked with. You know, you get you do have your buddies that you come up with, and if you guys are all growing in your careers, eventually you stop seeing each other by virtue of. Well, I'm playing Cleveland and my buddy's playing Boston. You know, you're you're just all over. So those kind of shows, it's like, hey, how's it going? Like you a get little reunion. Up. Yeah, a little reunion, cool. which is fun. Yeah, that's for really sure. Cool, man. But yeah, KevinBartini.com is the way to go. And also, you can see a lot of my videos on Pornhub. Yeah, you know, I've got them. Yeah, millions <laughs> of views. <laughs> just Google. Swinging dick. Yeah, just previ that. that previously thing where he was talking about chipping his teeth. That's, that's, that's uh, on the front page right there. Um, well, thank you so much for coming out oh, and yeah. being our guest on, on New York City Podcast My Festival. Pleasure. Um, we want to thank all you guys for supporting podcasts and, and all that stuff. And once again, we are fueled by Deathcast from Deathwish Coffee. You can find Deathwish Coffee on all the social media. We're starting a new Twitch campaign. So if you like video games, we're over there. We do this podcast every week. It comes out on Thursday um, with uh, a special guest every week. It's on iTunes, Stitcher, Google, all that stuff. 
Um, we just had an astronaut on the show last week, Ooh. and um, uh, upcoming wow, shows. Wow, I'm a step down. Not Holy even shit. close. <laughs> no, she was she was not funny at all. Uh. <laughs> and uh, and but upcoming shows, we've got uh, some really cool people like uh, Tate Fletcher and Richard Fortas from Guns N' Roses. So uh, follow us on that kind of stuff. And uh, thank you guys. You know, stick around. There's some really great shows coming. And uh, thank thank you, everybody. Thanks, guys. Wow. Thank you. Bye, guys. This has been Fueled by Deathcast, a Death Wish Coffee Company podcast production. Thanks for listening.